this week on the nonprofit news feed. Well, we're talking about how the DOJ is going after eBay for coal rolling. Yeah, we'll we'll get into that. We have Mr. Beast building wells, getting criticism, the right to shelter in New York City may be under threat, and an acquisition in the nonprofit sector. Tis the season. Speaking of stockings and gift giving, and I know we're not quite there yet, but maybe you've gotten coal in your stocking. And if Were you, you doing have a lump gotten of coal, coal in was your that a stocking, smooth transition? Oh, man, he's a, coming out fire and smooth transition. Coal in the stocking this season. What do we got? <laughs> well, the DOJ has put coal in the stocking of eBay because the Department of Justice has filed a complaint <laughs> against eBay, alleging that the company let over 343,000 aftermarket coal rolling devices to be purchased on the platform, according to DOJ paperwork filed in Brooklyn Federal Court. So CBS News says that the government alleges eBay has been selling these aftermarket coal rolling devices. And if you don't know what coal rolling is, it's the process of essentially revving your engine, bypassing you know, the mechanisms that limit the emissions and essentially blowing black smoke out of the, the back of your vehicle, right? A real manly show of, I drive a, a big truck, I emit lots of carbon into the atmosphere kind of deal. But 343,000 of these devices have been sold on email. And the DOJ, the, the number, the monetary number that they're charging is over $2 billion fine that could potentially be coming the way of eBay. George, this shows an aggressiveness by uh, Department of Justice prosecutors to go to the source, the nexus of a problem for an environmental impact, not just people using these illegal aftermarket devices, but actually going to the source, the seller, the platform, the, the online repository for these devices and hitting them with a hefty fine. Two billion is enormous. I don't know, George, what do you make of all this? Well, I think it's one interesting, you know, coal rolling goes back to like 2010 and it basically involves getting and installing one of these devices that modifies the amount of fuel entering the engine to produce excessive smoke. Why would you want that to happen is quite curious until you go onto YouTube and search coal rolling and you see that a lot of these are then used to make videos of literally coal rolling, which is blasting dark smoke, black smoke out of your exhaust pipe on bicycle riders or let's say teslas or priuses or any sort of object of green like progressive use of technology that you just want to blast uh, coal smoke on top of and so it's interesting because they're going upstream as you mentioned before the doj so instead of going after like trying to find each one of these ridiculous yet amazingly viewed videos and people doing this in the real world they're going to the source saying look if you're creating these, you know, ridiculous marketplaces for people to acquire these tools. And it's not just limited to this, because there are also things on eBay that you can buy to bypass and get around the emissions tests and standards. So look, if you are complicit in helping work against the environment, like, yeah, there should be a real tax for you against this. And, you know, frankly, access to these tools is a big part of it. And so I like what the DOG is doing. I'm surprised it has taken this long and is another way around, I'd say, just sort of isolating the work of helping the environment to just the EPA being like, no, 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 this is this is a marketplace problem. You know, this is a financial problem. This, you know, this expands across. And so I I think it is an interesting tactic also for nonprofits to consider what is the marketplace that is fueling the inefficiency or waste, or in this case, <laughs> coal rolling in the environment that you work in. Yeah, George, I think that that's absolutely an interesting idea here. And yeah, if you're a nonprofit organization, right, oftentimes you don't necessarily think that an online platform with a supposedly purely digital only footprint, right, could actually be one of the companies with the largest environmental impacts and implications, right? Um, eBay is at essence a website. And I think that especially as the Supreme Court kind of curtails the EPA's ability to issue new rules and, and roll has rolled back 
parts of you know environmental protection law, prosecutors can use the law more aggressively. And I think that's what we're we're seeing here is the Department of Justice being more aggressive in the laws already on the books to tackle environmental issues. So really interesting tactic. And yeah, I think if you're an environmental advocacy organization, nonprofit, this is a really interesting thing um, to talk about with your audience. All right. And I can take us into our next story. George, it's been a little bit since we've talked about Mr. Beast, the famous American YouTuber. Um, But we need to talk about this because, as reported by CNN and others, Mr. Beast a couple days ago dropped a video that now has 50, 60 million views already, um, where Mr. Beast builds 100 wells in Africa, um, in Kenya, Zimbabwe, and other countries in Africa. So philanthropist and YouTuber, uh, Mr. Beast uh, has garnered acclaim and some criticism to build 100 wells in Africa. Um, his acts have kind of highlighted the inaction of local governments, especially in Kenya. Um, there have been some Kenyan politicians who have said, you know, it's kind of embarrassing that it takes a 23-year-old American YouTuber to come build wells in our country. Um, and the wells have provided clean water access for hundred a hundred communities right that previously didn't have it um the video kind of highlighted how people had to walk so many miles to get water on a daily basis and this provides access to that um but there is criticism george and we've talked about there are some potentially problematic aspects when it comes to kind of creating this narrative and, and placing it into um the typical YouTube kind of viral video model, right? Um, so I think that there is some some criticism from that. But George, what do you think? Good thing, bad thing, or both? And um, you know, some people say, "Hey, Mr. Beast actually proactively said I'm going to get canceled for doing a good thing," and I think that kind of misses the point. I think it is a good thing; everyone would agree so. But I think there's conversations worth having um, about some of the more kind of complicated narratives about, you know, we talked about white savior complex and that sort of thing. So George, what do you think about this? I think the the Mr. Beast thread here is like the, the, the guy is genuinely philanthropic and it, you know, it's clear that even with the philanthropainment tag on, let's just be clear, he's going to get millions of views for, for doing this and creating this. Uh, he's, pouring that back into the the work locally i think some of the narrative in the video is a little uh i don't know for lack of a better word infantilizing or you know diminishing the power of a local community to do this for themselves as well as you know frankly other organizations like charity water who have like installed over 7800 wells in communities and provided extra services alongside that working with the community to build these wells since 2006 so you're like it's not like you're i disliked the positioning that like if no one else is gonna do it i shall do it and that that's a sour taste and it's a a narrative nuance but it lands for certain people in um in a very negative way but frankly if you're gonna go build wells and do it the right way hopefully working with the local community so that they can actually as a next step, like what happens if it breaks? What is the maintenance? And that hopefully when you're working with local groups and contractors, you're doing it in a sustainable way because you can actually do a net negative by upending the local infrastructure and the way that they currently survive. And then suddenly, oh, the well breaks and we don't have, let's say, all of the jugs and systems in place to go get that water again. And now we're actually worse off net of where we were. Uh, there's a lot of second order effects that if you just do one thing in isolation and don't consider the community and working with that community and listening to them, which can be very hard as a Western outsider, uh, that you can actually do an, a net negative. And we've seen a lot of that um, with international aid, unfortunately, time and time again. So net, hopefully positive, attention to the issue, positive, the framing could be better actually. Yeah, George, I agree with you. I think it's a good thing that those wells were built. The video is kind of weird. And I think I think infantilizing is the exact right 
word, right? It almost trivializes the problem, right? There's, you know, there's probably thousands of people that are, you know, you get snippets of images of for like half a second in this video who are Kenyan, Zimbabwean, um, very few get to speak in the video, right? It's the narrative is, you know, Mr. Beast is doing this good thing. Um, and I think, I think it's somewhat kind of, it oversimplifies the problem. It's like, why don't these people have access to clean water? Well, like nobody's done it, but asking the question, why is Sub-Saharan African poor? Like that is not an easy question to ask and it doesn't have easy solutions, right? And it's not just because, you know, there's not enough good people in the world, right? There's really complicated problems at play. And I think the video lacks nuance um, and lacks an attempt to kind of show that complexity. Um, and like, that's my problem with the video, even though I do think that what Mr. Beast did was a good thing, right? So, um, yeah, I happen to agree with you on that. Yeah, I mean, let's let's be clear. We are really getting into the nuance here, but at a high level, the most popular and influential person on YouTube is doing charitable work to improve the world and also his reputation, and I'm fine with that. Uh, I think there's a lot of lot of negative influences out there, and the fact that like this guy is a celebrity and somebody who people are like, ah, I want to be like Mr. Beast to get attention, but in the right way, not for, you know, when we were growing up, it was like, oh, look at me prank these people and take advantage of, you know, uh, <laughs> a vulnerability. And you're like, ah, oh, God. Um, so I, I'd say the sort of the reality television arc of like, all right, these aren't just, you know, stranding people on an island and having them fight for food, uh, but instead <laughs> feeding people, giving them water. I think take a step back if you're frustrated by this and realize like there are worse things. Yeah. And actually I think, this is I think very, very positive. Like I, you know, you can't deny that those wells are built. Uh, I'm sure there'll be people like following up and watching over time. What were the negative second order effects if they were done the wrong way? Hopefully he's working with local community partners and doing the listening necessary, not shown in the like high and tight video, but you should watch it. Uh, and by I mean you, I mean anyone in the game of storytelling because it's, the journey that he sells in there. We, we were here. Here's how things were until this happened. And now that this happened, people have this. Like, it is a formula, and wow, does it work. It does. It's great. It's great storytelling. Um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're going to keep getting these videos, right? At this point in time, Mr. Beast is one of the world's most popular philanthropists. Um, and we'll continue to, continue to see how these play out. But to your point, I was actually curious. I'm like, okay, who was actually the implementing partner here? Because it's not oh. like Mr. Beast yeah. has this. I couldn't figure it out. I went to the website. It said vaguely local partners. I don't know who yeah. that was. Is there some kind of NGO shadowing this? Like somebody has organized all this and it is not... A well, we talked about Mr. Beast's philanthropies, right? And so, yeah, I wonder how much of that arm is becoming more professionalized, potentially. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, it, it would be interesting, actually, to get to the root of what organizations actually doing the implementing. That'd be a, an interesting. Yeah, because question. when he did the, you know, giving 100 people eyesight, like he actually uh, went about that. I think it was 1,000 people, sorry, getting eyesight. Like that worked with local partners, like money was going to be going to, to nonprofits in that case. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be an interesting story. Interesting story. All right, George, I'm going to take us into our next one. And this comes from nonprofit news. New York City's right to shelter is under threat amid the migrant influx. We've talked about this story before. New York City, like, other cities in America is facing something of a crisis when it comes to migrants. There was a showdown a couple months ago with migrants stranded outside of a hotel in Midtown Manhattan in a very public um, and very kind of embarrassing uh, headlines for the country. Here, um, New York City has had a decades old, quote, right to shelter policy, which it's more complicated, but vaguely states that um, everyone has access, everyone, regardless of 
citizenship, et cetera, any other criteria um, is has a right to temporary shelter. Um, but uh, the Adams administration, um, Mayor Eric Adams in New York, is attempting to modify it to address migrant influx, claiming essentially that they can't pro <laughs> they can't provide such shelters um, for people. So there's a showdown right now over the right to shelter in New York City um, that has national implications. Um, this could potentially be a bellwether for homeless policies, immigration policies. Um, Eric Adams, for those outside of New York circles, is a Democratic mayor, um, but largely considered a very, very moderate Democratic mayor. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see both how the policy and the politics kind of evolve from this over the next couple months. I really hope for many reasons that Eric Adams does not succeed in removing this right to shelter in New York City, because it will allow, I think, a couple things to happen. One is that we'll not be able to properly understand and track this problem as we should. And it is a multi-pronged problem, not just sort of for people that are unhoused in New York City for, you know, the, the normal economic reasons that we've dealt with before, but now because of the influx of, uh, of migrants into the city. And I think it might mask or allow us to hide from the fact that we need an empathetic border policy. And simply letting unlimited amounts of people come through the border and go into cities and then suddenly not be taken care of allows us to sort of ignore what should be happening. When we allow too many migrants in for our nonprofit infrastructure and our city infrastructures to take care of them, we end up doing more harm. And if we can't sort of see that harm, we can't have to pay the price for that. It allows us to sort of continue on with what is unfair at every level for an immigration policy that should be far more empathetic for allowing the people to come in with the right services in place. Uh, otherwise, we, we create a, a much worse uh, net policy uh, for everyone. And I think part of this, like right to shelter, if you are voting for unlimited amounts of immigration in, you should be right to shelter in every single city everywhere, um, because we have to acknowledge, we have to take care of the people that come into this country. That's the promise. Uh, so I have also in the past been part of the New York City homeless count uh, and know the folks involved with that. What an incredible effort that they do every year in Q1. I think in February, some of the coldest nights, they go out and they do some of the most amazing sampling of the unhoused population in the city. And they have, literally, they have decoys out there as well. So they can actually tell the error rate of the sampling that they do, and they get an accurate look at the, the total homeless count. So I'm, I'm going to be watching that for sure uh, as we come into 2024. Um, I may even pull in a special guest uh, to give us some analysis on, on how that goes. But for many reasons, uh, I hope that Eric Adams does not succeed in this particular effort to remove right to shelter. Absolutely, George. I think that that is a sound analysis um, and one that we uh, will continue to follow. Um, and, and of course, you know, big, big problems um, and hopefully come with big solutions. But George, how about a feel good story? Oh, wait, hold on. Let's, let's skip over one thing. <laughs> I've threw in this extra extra piece because I like looking for uh, sort of mergers, acquisitions in the social impact sector. And recently, uh, old old friend, uh, I don't know if he's probably been on the pod at some point, but old friend David Hesekiel, founder of Engage for Good, uh, sold, in fact, sold this leading conference for corporate and nonprofit professionals to create mutually beneficial social impact partnerships, an amazing conference, uh, sold it to social impact expert Munir uh, Panjwani and also former uh, colleague of mine uh, back in the days of Do Something. And so uh, he's taken over there and I'm excited to see uh, what comes. Super exciting. Um, yeah, we'll definitely follow up on this story. All right, now you can get to your feel-good story. <laughs> All right, this one's exciting. This one comes from Denver 7 Colorado News, which says that the nonprofit Donor Alliance has partnered with a drone company, uh, Matador UAS Consortium, to test drone transportation of organs and medical specimens in Colorado and Wyoming. Um, for those who don't know, 
Um, organ donation is uh, an extremely intense kind of process of um, you know getting organs where they need to go very very quickly um, to save lives. This is life saving emergency work. Some organizations use little barnstorming planes, um, helicopters, etc. Um, and I think drones is a great uh, solution for remote communities. Um, so this is really, really cool stuff. Drones are, you know, that's as 21st century kind of uh, tech as it gets. Um, and the ability to literally save lives um, is really exciting. Yeah, it sheds light also on the fact that, especially in uh, rural communities, it can be hard to get organs delivered in that time window, that very sensitive time window that is necessary uh, in organ procurement. It's not just enough to have organ registrations. That is only half uh, of the work. Uh, the other very significant half is uh, things that you know Donor Alliance is trying to work on, making sure that organs are uh, actually, in, in the end, it may sound weird, you know, harvested and delivered to the people that need the most. Donor Alliance, also a former client of Whole Whale, and I love to see them in the news for advancing technology that might roll out as early as 2024. So good on you all. Although I do have Absolutely. a bit of a joke. Why does Donor Alliance actually have a hard time with stomach donations, though? I don't know, George. Why is that? Uh, they're hard to digest. Ah, I yeah. see. I see. I, I got see. You. I got I see. you. Uh, yes, Donor Alliance. Uh, they ask you to join 66% of Coloradans and 61% of, I'm going to get this wrong, Wyomingites who have registered to become organ donors. Uh, their mission is to save lives through organ and tissue donation and transplantation. And uh, to do this, they employ effective family approach to recover programs in more than 100 hospitals. And they also inspire the public to register as organ donors do please check to see that you are an organ donor all right nick that's what i got for you thanks george